Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here today to listen to Dr. Melissa Rogerson. Melissa is a researcher at the University of Melbourne. She works on human-computer interaction and she is like a specialist of hybrid board game. <laughs> <laughs> so for now, five years, we've been working in Gaming Lab in collaboration with uh, Melissa. Uh, so two studies have been funded and conducted through Gaming Lab. And today, Melissa is going to present us all the extent and interest of her work. So Melissa, thank you. The stage is yours. <laughs> thank you, Leah. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're a small group, so if you have questions, please feel free to, to interrupt and jump in. I'll try to be on time, but there's always a lot more to say um, that, that, than there's time for. So I'm going to start by introducing myself and the group that I'm from, um, then talk about three of my projects and finally look at what's coming next for my research. Um, so. As Leah said, I'm Melissa Rogerson. I, I sort of come to this project from, from three different perspectives, I suppose. Um, first is I love to play games. Um, I've been playing games for a long time. I'm active, less active these days, on Board Game Geek. I'm on the International Gamers Association jury. I was the first woman on that jury. Um, and, and I've been very involved in different um, tabletop activities and, and particularly board gaming activities. I also translated a number of games which are now in the Asmodee stable. So I've worked with uh, Lookout Games. I translated um, Agricola from uh, German to English, Le Havre, um, several of, of the games that they published kind of around that time. And of course, I'm also a researcher and I'm a senior lecturer in human computer interaction at um, the University of Melbourne. And as part of, part of that, and as part of my interest in board games, I also do a lot of media. So I'm a regular guest on um, the radio in Australia as well. And a, a bit of a research history, and then I will talk later about what comes next. But as Leah said, we've had this fantastic, you know, five-year relationship. I think it was 2020 that we were set, I was coming over to, to Paris, and of course we know what happened. Um, so here I am, four years late. Um, but I've had these two terrific grants um, from Game in Lab, and also um, in, in between them, one from my university. And I don't know how the university grant system works here, but I imagine it's very similar. Grants get grants, right? Once you're successful in getting a grant, you get more grants. And once you're successful at getting more grants, you get bigger grants. And once you're successful at that, you get promoted. Um, and and this, is, this is really important. And I just really want to stress how important those grants from Game in Lab have been for my career as well, um, as well as actually for doing this research. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Um, the University of Melbourne, we like to boast we're the best university, the number one university in Australia um, in the world university rankings. They just changed the way they do the rankings and we suddenly shot up to number 14 in the world. Um, the School of Computing and Information Systems that I'm part of is the top ranked um, school of, I think, engineering and IT in Australia, and we're also ranked number one for human computer interaction and um, 22 in the world. So we're quite, we're quite a large university and um, quite, quite an important university in the Australian setting. And within the human computer interaction group, there are three of us with an interest in games, Martin Gibbs, me, and Lucy Sparrow. And I've collaborated with both of, those, both of them on some of these projects. Um, we also have a big group of graduate researchers um, who are working on games. I haven't listed, I actually have two students who are working on technology and older adults, but not specifically games, so I haven't listed them there. And I am looking for up to four more PhD candidates as well um, at the moment. And they're working on a range of different projects about different kinds of games. So Brian's looking at Let's Play videos, which are mainly about digital games. Um, 
Matt is looking at theory of mind, AI and board games and I stole this photo from him as part of one of his research studies. He's built an interface to chat GPT to generate clues for the game codenames. It's not very good, but it's really interesting. Um, Nellie is looking at games and especially role-playing games in museums. Um, Jeffrey is looking at World of Warcraft private servers and the history of people kind of making their own versions of older versions of World of Warcraft. Um, and Kyle is looking at using AI to understand what's happening while a game is being played. And then we have other students who I'm not directly supervising who are also working with games or more broadly with kind of pop culture ideas. So it's a, it's a great group and a great place to have conversations about research and about um, what we're thinking about with our work. So hybrid digital board games. And we define these as board games in which play is enacted through both physical components and a smart digital element. And I'll come back to that definition because it's, it's not perfect and it doesn't quite catch some of the things that, that I want to work on. Um, but it's always good to start with a definition that you can break later on. But importantly in this, the digital component is not added to the game. It's something that is designed as part of the game and it's necessary to play the game. I, I will say we had a lot of trouble with the game Gloomhaven um, because Gloomhaven was published as a board game and then somebody made an app to go with it. And when we asked people, do you play hybrid games? A lot of them said, I play Gloomhaven. We said, well, that doesn't quite fit our definition. But now um, the designer, the publisher of Gloomhaven has really come around and is designing things specifically to go with that app. So that app has actually become official. So now it's a hybrid. You can see why I say our definition's not quite right. Um, for our work on hybrid digital board games, we started with a... Um, by wanting to kind of explore people's experience of hybrid games and what they thought of as hybrid games. And so we, we did a small survey of about 237 people. Uh, we did interviews with 18 or 19 game designers. And this isn't, you know, my friend down the street who's made a game that he likes to play with his sister. Um, this is, this is published designers, people with games in, you know, the top 20 on Board Game Geek, people with Spiel des Jahres wins, um, so professionals working in the industry. And we also had what we call critical play sessions. Critical play sessions as a game researcher and someone who loves playing games, they're the best, right? Because that's where you sit down with other people and you actually just start playing some games with them. Um, and we also, we also did some card sorting activities. And what we wanted to do here was understand what are people doing? Why is there a hybrid component in these games? What does it bring to the games? And building on that data, we developed this model. There'll be a test later, so make sure you can read all of the very tiny font, um, where we came up with 41 different ways, different functions that digital technology performs in these games. This is the overall view of the model. We have a paper, which I think is actually on the Game in Lab site, which describes all of those. But here you can see the eight kind of top level domains that we identified. So um, people use hybrid functions to do a timing in a game, randomising, housekeeping. Oop, um, obviously, I've got some smarts in here that I didn't know I had. Informing storytelling, remembering, calculating and teaching. And so here, for example, is the housekeeping domain. And some of these things occur more often than others. So for example, that first one, include or exclude particular items or objects. So if you think about the Lord of the Rings journeys in Middle Earth, um, the game selects the map components. It tells you which maps you need to put on the table, which, um, which creatures you will encounter. Um, and so it's doing that including or excluding as well, of course, as lots of other things. And our paper 
doesn't contain an exhaustive list of all of the games that use these functions, um, but rather just examples to help people to understand what they're useful for. And as I said, some of them are used less commonly than others. So for example, uh, 3.7 update the game. Um, I think Chronicles of Crime by David Sicurel does this very well. There are not very many games that let you kind of make a new scenario or, or download a new scenario using the existing components that you've um, started with. From those interviews that we did, we also started to look at what are the, the considerations when you design or publish a hybrid game. And we came up with these five, we call them guiding principles for designing digital tools. Um, what are some of the problems with hybridity? What are some of the ways that we can start to overcome them? So can we, can we see what's gone on, right? It's very easy if you're playing a board game, you can understand what somebody just did. But sometimes if you're playing a game on a computer or a game that is assisted by a computer, it's hard to know what's just happened. Um, completeness. This is, this is particularly a concern about games becoming obsolete, games not being playable anymore. And that kind of filters through some of the other um, concerns here as well. Uh, but it's really important that players have all the tools on hand that they need to play the game. Integration is really about the relationship between a digital tool and the physical pieces. So making sure that they speak to one another and that players aren't just focusing on the digital tool or aren't just focusing on the physical pieces, but that they work together. And very, very strong feedback from our participants was that the digital tool is just another part of the game, right? Um, we also have privacy. Um, I had an interesting experience where I was playing an unlock game with two international students who hadn't been at Melbourne for very long. And I wanted them to, to do a study of how people learn to play unlock games. And I realised something strange was happening because they weren't interacting with the game the way that I expected them to. And it took me a little while to realise that I had my mobile phone on the table to play the game. I'm sorry, I just tapped my microphones. Um, but I had my mobile phone on the table to play the game and they were very uncomfortable because I was their teacher and they didn't feel that they ought to be touching my mobile phone. So thinking about ideas of privacy with, with what we show and also which devices we're using. Um, and lastly, materiality, being able to touch things, being able to manipulate things and move things. And I will come back to that very shortly. So that was the first project that I worked on with, um, with Game in Lab. And then I, then we had two years of social distancing, right, in, in Melbourne and a bit, um, where we couldn't visit each other's homes to play games together. And even now, you know, there are some concerns or somebody always seems to be sick um, when you want to sit around a table playing a game. So I started to ask, well, how can we use technology to connect people who are not in the same room, but who want to play a physical game together? Very early in my PhD, I looked at why people like playing board games. And it really, all of the interviews that I did came down to four things. One is that sociality, sitting around a table, sharing time with other people. The second is the challenge or intellectual challenge, being able to think about something, not passively consuming um, and a film or a, a book, but actually being involved in what's going on, making meaningful decisions. Variety is also really important. We don't always play the same game. Um, some people do. I grew up, my dad was a champion bridge player. You know, he played bridge several nights a week. Um, but, but generally when we look at people who like board games, they like different board games and they'll talk about, you know, having the right game for the right group of people. Um, and lastly, but still really important, materiality, being able to touch the pieces. And people use the pieces to, um, to make sense of the game, but also the pieces are often a really important part of their enjoyment of the game. Um, 
So what you can see though here on the right, you can kind of see, is a group of people playing together um, over Zoom or some video calling software, but they're playing with physical pieces. And this was a photo that I found online, um, but from what I can tell, somebody's looking after the cards, somebody's looking after the pieces, this person's kind of replicating what's going on, there's a, a top-down camera showing what's going on on the board. So they're finding ways to have that social experience of playing with other people and that physical experience of playing with pieces. And we did a, a survey, ended up being a really big survey. We had about 1,300 people um, respond to the survey about how people were making this sort of play happen. And some of you will have seen this next slide before, but I just love it, so I include it whenever I can in a presentation. I'm going to read you what one of the participants told us. So they said, I used an iPad, logged into a secondary account and mounted on a tripod sat on the table to show the board and pieces and run audio through headphones unless I was playing with members of my household as well. While I used my phone, logged into my primary Discord account to take closer up photos of cards and post these in a text channel for reference for the players, typing their names as captions so the channel was searchable. It's still going, I promise. I used my own Discord setup for this purpose with separate channels for each game. I also sometimes had my laptop logged into my primary account on the table and used it for video and or better audio. I think there's even a little bit more here. Um, and sometimes, yeah, and sometimes um, a view of the board as well. So you can see that the enormous amount of effort and thought that this person has put into this, this setup. And I really, I had to draw it out to kind of understand just how complex it was. But what people also told us was that they didn't want to do this for themselves, right? They wanted games that were designed to be played this way or instructions for how to play existing games this way. So we set out to to see what designing games for this context might look like. And we used a, a research method called research through design, where basically you make things and then you think about what's good or what's not so good about them. And the idea is not to make something that's perfect. And the idea is not to make a game that, that you're going to submit for publication, but it's to understand what's happening in that space. So we developed a creativity support tool that we call the SMEFT Dex, and I have a couple of copies of this if anyone would like one. Um, but they're cards to inspire and support the design of games for distanced play. We tried a few different ways to use them, but we found that um, playing a little drafting game where everybody gets a few cards, then passes the ones they haven't chosen on to the next person works really well. Um, so here's an example of a set of cards that one group used and Leah has a copy of the slides as well that she can share. Um, and also the game concept that they developed where um, it's called The Library is Burning and the players are trying to rescue books from a burning library um, but each player has a secret book genre that they want to rescue the most of. Um, players can't see each other because there's smoke from the fire so that's why you can't see the other players. But if you're near enough, you can hear them moving and you may even be able to talk to them. And then this group had this lovely idea that, well, it's a library. So you can't just take books and walk out with them. You have to use the scanner to check your book out as you leave. Now, as I said, we were interested in what the big ideas would, were that would come out of this project. And we found that there were really six. The first one was about understanding the design space. Um, I think that when we started working on this project, we were quite naive. We thought the distance play might be about kind of robot arms and video conferencing. And the more we worked with people on new ideas, the more we learned about different ways that we could do this work. Um, the affordances of distance play. So affordances in human computer interaction is a concept of what does an object <coughs> invite us to do? So a chair, invites sitting, it also maybe invites us to put things on it, not just ourselves. 
and we found that um, communication was really important and breaking communication was something that was particularly easy to do in this setting. Material pacing, by that I mean using the pieces to slow down the players so they can't just sort of say, well, I've collected all the books, I'm finished. This, that idea where they were scanning the books out kind of gives a nice, a nice speed or a nice rhythm to the game. The interplay between the digital and physical elements. So how do the digital elements work with the physical elements to pull them together? An idea, I can't believe this didn't occur to us before we started, but not everyone needs to be distanced. You may have two groups of people or you may have one group of people playing with one or two people who are on their own. Um, and lastly, this really important idea of reframing distance to play, not as oh, something we have to do because we can't go outside again this week, but as something that's fun and different and gives new opportunities. We also, um, building on the, the large survey that we did, we looked at much more specific design considerations for distanced play. And um, we built this, this model, uh, which we call the DIE framework because we like a good name. Um, but it looks at questions like, what sort of game should we design for distanced play? How should we set up the game? And um, how do we make the game work between all of the players. We've also explored designing for this setting, mainly through uh, projects with master's students. So I have a few examples there and on our website there are some more examples of um, some of the games and the way that some of the games actually physically work as well. So we have videos of most of the games. Um, and again, that just helps to understand this setting a little bit better. Lastly, my second project with um, Game in Lab, and I know I still owe you a final report, and you'll kind of see why in a moment, I think. Um, and uh, working on this project with me were Lucy Sparrow again, and also Damon Flicker. Um, and what we wanted to understand was the alignment between the model that we had built and uh, the other function, the mechanisms that go into, um, into games, what um, Engelstein and Shallow have called the building blocks of the games. And we started by downloading data from Board Game Geek about all of the games that they classified as digital hybrid app or website required. We know that's not a perfect list. We know there are errors in there and, and missing games, but the list exists, so it was a good place for us to start. And, you know, this is kind of... Well, it's an enormous spreadsheet. It's something like 175 columns and 491 rows and over 80,000 cells in the spreadsheet. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is we've downloaded details about what mechanisms are used in the game, according to Engelstein and Shalev, and then Damon went through and actually classified the games according to our model as well. So what hybrid functions were they using? And we didn't play all of the games, we played a few, um, but mainly he used videos, he used the rules to look at those. And I mean, the first thing we did was already really interesting. We looked at how common the different mechanisms are on Board Game Geek for 400,000 board games. And unsurprisingly, the most common mechanism is dice rolling. And then we looked at what were the most common mechanisms among those hybrid games. And we see that the list is kind of completely different. Some of the things that are, that are on that list on the left, the, the most common mechanisms on Board Game Geek, don't even appear on the, um, on the hybrid list and vice versa. So storytelling, for example, is nowhere on, um, in the top 20 on Board Game Geek. Um, I think it's about 30, no, about 50 maybe, um, but yet it's the second most prevalent mechanism in the, um, in the hybrid games. So then we, we started to explore what's going on here. So we've got this very fancy chart. Anything above the, the line, above the dotted line, is more common in 
hybrid games than it is in kind of general games. Anything below the line is less common in hybrid games than it is in general games. And we've used a log scale here to try to spread the responses out a bit. But generally, kind of the further away something is from the line, the greater the difference in how common it is. Another way to look at that, we can look at those top 20 mechanisms and say, well, what's only in the top 20 on Board Game Geek? What's only in the top 20 for hybrids? And what's in the top 20 for both? Um, and then we started to say, well, is it just that hybrid games are more modern? So they have different mechanisms than the older games on Board Game Geek. But, you know, dice rolling, that's still in the top 20 in both. And uh, something like Hexagon Grid, you know, maybe that's a bit old fashioned. That's only on, on Board Game Geek. But then things like simultaneous action selection are still quite common. So we don't think that it's just different style of game and more modern game. So we looked at how common those hybrid domains or hybrid functions were in the, um, in the rated games. We actually at this point said, okay, there are 488 hybrids, but only 144 of them have a ranking on Board Game Geek. So we're going to focus on those 144. And we looked at how, um, how the different domains in our model are used. Interestingly, randomising is only used in 10% of those games. That really surprised me because that's something computers are really good at. Um, but storytelling was used in 78% of those games. Now, we wondered whether that might be because there's a lot of different types of games. For example, I think there were about 40 unlock games in our study. So we thought, well, is it just the unlock games are telling some kind of a story? So, um, we, we squeezed them down, right? We said, okay, let's just consider Unlock to be one game. And we still had this sort of picture of um, storytelling being very popular for these games. Um, housekeeping is also very, very popular and some form of calculating as well. So we're starting to see that there's definitely hybrid games are different, right, from other games. Then we asked how many hybrid functions does each game include? And we found that on average it was about seven from our model. There's one game with 18, that's World of Yoho. And there's one game with one, which I think is, um, it's called Holiday Hijinks, The Cupid Crisis. And I've got a copy waiting in my office in Melbourne for me to try. We also looked at what were the most common functions, right, from our detailed model and what functions did we not see. And interestingly, we do not have an example of a game that uses a digital tool to roll dice. I would have thought that would have been one of the top choices there. We also looked, remember I told that story about the escape room, so we looked at how many devices people need to play. Um, there's one where you need two devices exactly for the whole game, um, but most commonly you only need one device for the whole game. Um, there are others though where either each player needs a device or players can choose to share devices if they want to. So then we said, okay, but what about the games that are similar to each other? Um, yeah, so this is an example of where we've, we've grouped the games together. Um, so here we've looked at the top 20 mechanisms on Board Game Geek, and then we've looked at how they use, which of those big domains in our model they have used. You can see um, cooperative games kind of covers everything else um, by a long way. And when we group those games together, like I said, we treat all of the unlocked games, for example, as one game, it's still looks very much the same. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting here is all of those columns look the same. They look very similar. And so we've kind of disproved what we set out to explore because we thought that particular mechanisms would use particular functions. Um, but actually what we're seeing is 
all of these mechanisms are kind of using much the same set of functions. One question that we have here is whether instead of just saying, yes, it does this, yes, it does this, maybe we should have said, how important is it to the game? Use some kind of judgment. Uh, I've got a couple more bits of data for you. This chart's way too small to be useful, but this is about what functions occur together. So a dark blue dot says, we, this, function, this combination occurs more often than we would expect. A red dot suggests this combination occurs less often than we would expect. And we kind of, we like this chart and we want to draw this out because it feels like there's some opportunities there. Um, we don't think that the functions don't occur together because they can't occur together. It's more because nobody's thought of that yet. And we have this sense that people are really copying the models that have already been successful, which of course is what happens in game design anyway. Now I really need Damon here to explain this chart because this is big st statistical stuff here. Um, but essentially what we did here was we fed all of our data into a model to see whether it would find clusters of games, whether we could say, oh, this, is, this here is a particular type of game and this is a particular type of game. And the answer is, again, it didn't really work. Um, there aren't, there, there are sort of maybe some suggestions of, of clusters, but we can't kind of mathematically say this game is like this game. Maybe reclassifying, as I said, those games according to how important the functions are might give us that information. And it might also help us with um, diagrams like this, which we want to use to tell players what the technology is used for in a particular game. We explored whether just a count, you know, this game has three different timing functions, it has six different housekeeping functions, was that going to provide useful information? And it was a terrible idea. It, it was really meaningless. So we found that these diagrams seem to be useful, but they need to convey something about how important each of those elements is, not just that it exists. So a few lessons learned and some future work that's, um, that's sitting there. Um, the first one is that question about following successful models, right? And how can we introduce some new models, right? Or encourage people to try maybe some new things in their games and continuing to explore what designers and publishers think about the model as well. Um, we've learned that hybrid games are using lots of different mechanisms um, and that there are big families of games, right? And we know from, from just our observation that there aren't just the unlock games, but there are all so very many different series of, um, of escape room or puzzle room type games in this space. Um, the most innovative games don't necessarily use the most hybrid functions. That was a relief because we said all along, it's not a cookbook. It's not, oh, I'm going to have one of those and two of those and I might have a couple of storytelling as well. Um, it's actually about the big picture of the game that you want to make. Um, and of course, that there are so many opportunities to explore these very underused functions as well. Um, and these are kind of the observations that we have so far from our interviews, and I think a lot of them are not very helpful. Um, so things like technology can attract new audiences. Well, you know, we kind of know that, right? Or, or that the decision to make these games often comes from the publisher rather than from a designer. I'm sure you guys know that better than I. Um, but there are three there that I think are particularly interesting. Um, one of them is how we use hybrid technologies meaningfully in games to make interesting play. Um, one is what the boundaries are of a hybrid game. And lastly, there was this interesting finding that doesn't quite fit the rest about older adults and their relationships with technology as well. Which brings me to the next stuff. Um, so I've been very fortunate. As I said, grants get grants, right? Um, so I have what's called a Discovery Early Career Researcher Grant. This is a, a really prestigious um, Australian government grant. You're only allowed to apply for it twice ever in your career. You're only allowed to hold one of these grants. And 
This year there was about a 20%, just under 20% success rate. Um, it's worth about 725,000 euros when I combine what the university is putting in and what the government's putting in. Over three years, that does include my salary, so it's not like I'm rolling in money, I'm afraid. Um, and that money is really um, used for salaries, travel costs, equipment costs, participant payments, um, and some exhibitions and video demonstrations that we want to make as well. Um, so I have a postdoctoral researcher starting in July, and I'm looking for up to two funded PhD students for this project. Um, there are three things I'm doing here. The first one is to build a technology history of hybrid board games. And this is really where I'm exploring those, those boundaries because we, we look back to 1910 and the game Lichtra, um, which was um, presented at the um, Leipzig Electricity Fair. It's a quiz game where you hold an electrode on one side to a question, on the other side to an answer. If you have the correct combination, a light goes on. It's not a smart game, right, if you think back to my original definition. But it's clearly the start of using technology and using electricity in these games. And so that's where I say I'm, I'm sort of playing with that definition a bit um, to see whether uh, what we consider to be a hybrid and really broadening it to uses of technology. The second one is examining the user experience of hybrid board games. Um, so we want to actually understand how playing a hybrid changes the play experience, whether playing a hybrid changes the play experience compared to playing a board game. So we've identified a couple of games where they, they would make sense if that game was a hybrid and we're going to actually make a hybrid version of it. We're starting with a game called Duck Duck Go um, with little ro using little robots instead of ducks um, and um, looking at both what is the experience for the players, but also if you're going to be in this study, turn off this video now, um, we're going to give people a little test on the rules at the end and see whether, whether playing one version or another actually helps them to learn the rules better. Um, and finally, kind of creating a playbook for modern hybridity. So thinking about how we can create reusable digital components, maybe um, archiving some of the older games that um, the apps are no longer available for. Um, and for this project, I have two advisory groups. I have the Critical Play Reference Group. That's basically a game club that come into my university around about once a month to play hybrid games and tell me what they thought of them. Um, and the Hybrid Play Advisory Group, where I'm looking for representatives from, um, from publishers, um, people who've been designing these kind of games, to maybe just meet up on a Zoom call every six months to talk about where the project is going. So if anyone is interested, talk to me. It's all talk to me, right? Um, and also with that middle one, visiting archives, I'll be back in Europe between August and October this year, and I'm really keen to set up visits to game archives um, and of course to colleagues as well. Another project that's, that's kind of a bit different, but it picks up, remember, on that older adults corner that I had on an earlier, um, present, uh, on an earlier slide. And um, my colleague, I'm very fortunate to work with Dr. Jenny Waycott, who's an expert on technology and ageing, and we supervise a couple of PhD students together. But we also wanted to put together a project to, to work on together. And we were very fortunate that that has also been funded by the Australian Research Council. Um, and the project is with Jenny Waycott and with Martin Gibbs and Lucy Sparrow, so the other two kind of games researchers as well. And we're doing three different things. We want to understand storytelling and life storytelling of um, older adults, so older people telling the story of their life. And we're doing that in three ways. I'm going to start with theirs and then talk about mine. So we're looking at um, storytelling about objects and places using augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, we're looking at the use of generative AI tools like ChatGPT to help people to write their life stories and tell their stories. And what I'm interested in, and again, you know, looking for PhD students, um, is designing a hybrid board 
or card game that ties in with people telling their story but if I can be really mean for a moment, makes it interesting for the other people that are playing it because we know that we often have a situation where um, a grandparent or a great grandparent wants to talk about their life and about their childhood but their grandchildren maybe aren't old enough to be interested yet um, or their children are really busy and they don't make the time to explore this. Um, so we want to make a game that they can play together and explore those stories. Thank you so much. Um, that's everything that I sort of prepared, but I'm really happy to have a conversation and answer any questions too. Um, maybe I can start. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you Melissa, for all your presentation. Uh, first, on the practical side, do you need help on communication for all the PhD and people you need to embody on your projects? Um, yes, yes. I'm, we, have, we have two advertisements now that I will share with you um, looking for the PhD students and I'm, I will share them and maybe if, if you're happy to as well, you know, we're, they're certainly, I'm just going to sit down, um, they're certainly open to anybody, you know, around the world as well um, to come and, and study with us. So. So we can share the information on the GitHub network for sure, but also we have a subsidiaries in Australia now, so mm. there is help on the communication on that side. Yeah. Uh, do you have in your research some trends on the e game? If there is like an increase this. of uh, application, if it was like a spike in the last two years, is this maybe less? Do you have some history of I, this kind of thing? I could, I could extract that. It's definitely increased and it definitely has increased in the last 10 years, probably the last eight years as well. There were kind of uh, a few, a few, a few, whoa, suddenly there were a lot. Um, and it would be very, very easy to extract those, um, those years as well. But it seems to still be increasing. Um, one of the things that we found was it's very expensive to make a hybrid game and it's very expensive to maintain a hybrid game. And so building a family of games where you can reuse your digital um, tools is obviously more effective. We also find with designers that the designers who can actually make their own apps themselves, um, at least for playtesting, um, seem to seem to be more interested in making hybrid games. Um, it's, it's a real problem for people that don't have those technology skills. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have something that measure the appealing of a board game for players? Not yet. That's, that's what I'm wanting to work on with this idea of how much did you enjoy the game, um, but then also, mm, how much do you know about how to play the game? Because I think they're two different things to measure. Um, yeah, how, how much do they understand the game, but also how much did they enjoy it? We know that some of the things that, um, it's not fair to say that we sneer at, but that, that we find uninteresting in games can be really popular. Um, I have a game called Woofy Whoops which you hook your phone up to a plastic dog on a turntable in the middle of the board and the dog is connected to a fire hydrant that you fill with water and at some point during the game the dog pees on one of the players by shooting water. Um, it's kind of stupid, right? Like it's not an interesting game, there's not really a lot of game there. But, you know, people have a lot of fun playing it. So um, I, I have to, I suppose, check my tendency to, to say, oh, but that's not a very good game, and say, people are having a lot of fun with this. That's fantastic. Um, and one of the groups that is quite difficult to reach um, is just families that, that play. If I, if I say I want families that play board games, I get families that are playing... Carcassonne, Catan, Ticket to Ride, Sushi Go, uh, not families who are playing the game that is $15 at the, at the department store um, 
and looks like it might be fun. You know, I think my mother gave me one that's about flushing toilets. And she said, oh, this has power, you know, this has batteries, this might be something you like. And, and again, it's, it's not a game I've ever been interested to try, but I need to reach the people that are playing those kinds of games. And that's where going to some of these festivals, making videos about our work, but also being there to talk to people about what kinds of games they're playing is so important. And just to finish, uh, you have shown us the graphic about the correlation between function and application and some opportunities there. And that uh, information will be public. Mm -hmm. So are you expecting publisher like jumping on it to develop things? It'd be wonderful if they did. You know, we'd, we'd love to, and we'd love to, to work with anyone to kind of say, hey, we think there's an opportunity here. We think that, you know, these, these functions might work well together. Um, we, I, I should say, you know, we're having a lot of fun designing games or designing or prototype games. Absolutely not looking for a new career as a game designer. Absolutely not expecting that any of those games are, are something that could be published, but they're interesting for exploring uh, what we can do. Thank you for the presentation. Thank it's, uh, you. It's great to you just one or two comments and uh, to have also your comments. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a doctor. And so uh, I was amazed by the fact that you try to understand games as we try to understand cognition and the underlying mechanism in neuroscience. Mm -hmm. So th th this is great. And, and at the same time, I I'm a little bit disappointed not to have so many too much information about the how, uh, you just say after uh, the, the, the question, uh, how uh, the people uh, uh, enjoy the game. I said, how the people enjoy the game and why the people yeah. enjoy the game and, uh, uh, and the emotion. I take an example. Uh, when, when you speak about uh, the, the distance game during the, uh, the pandemic and so on, uh, and there, there is some photography of, uh, uh, you say, you will take it on the, on the website. For instance. It is fascinating how people uh, try to uh, to develop to be creative in order to uh, to play that game. Mm. Okay, and uh, I guess it's the same in a, in a very simple board game. I take a lot of fun uh, preparing the game, and the other there is also other guys who are not interested at all. Mm. So uh, my, my question is in in your future in your future project and, and big grants. Uh, also, do you uh, take into account what is my feeling? I think that's really absolutely essential. I will say too, in the, the paper with the die framework that we published, one of the things that we looked at was the ways that people play games. And we found that often there is, there is somebody who likes to set up the game and likes to teach the game. And there's other people that you know, just want to show up and, and play. Um, but absolutely, I think that why is really important and, and that's something that um, we're going to be working on more with this big grant now. Because there, there, is, there is a slide on the, on the clustering and the difficulty you observe. Mm -hmm. But imagine if you add to this the different type of feeling or emotion uh, that is linked when I'm going to play to a ticket for ride or to another. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that uh, at the same time, you perhaps you have a more complexification of your, uh, your, your slide, but perhaps not. Yes, no, I think you're right. I think that, um, that types of fun is a really interesting question, you know, and when I interview people, they'll say, um, oh, I like this game because we, we laugh a lot when we play it, or I like this game because, um, because I have to think a lot. And that thinking is part of the fun of playing the game. And um, yeah, there's a lot more complexity that, that we could work on. And I think that's interesting when we think about what these hybrid functions are used for, right? So we've started with the game, um, but if we say 
things like, well, storytelling, you know, makes, makes the game feel more immersive, maybe makes it a more social experience, for instance. Um, but what do some of the other functions do to help that enjoyment? Yeah, thank yeah, you. <laughs> and maybe if you study, like, yeah, fun, you could explain also the prevalence of the hybrid function. You know, for example, for randomizing, dice rolling, it's only like 10%, something like that. But maybe players really like to, you know, roll the dice with <laughs> their material. And on the contrary, maybe for other functions, they like it to be autom automated. I, I think you're right. And some of my colleagues um, wrote a beautiful paper um, about 10 years ago called The Roll of Dice in Warhammer 40,000, where they looked at people who were literally rolling this many dice at once. Um, but they loved that, that spectacle, that feeling, the noise that the dice make and the sight of the dice bouncing on the table. Um, yeah. The trust uh, to the application. Yeah, it's, oh, it's trust really, is uh, really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how would you explain this increasing interest for hybrid board games and digital tools? Because you know, in the media, there's there like a debate on digital versus non-digital, screen versus no screen. So, how would you explain this interest? So they definitely get caught in that, and we get we do hear people saying, "Oh, you know, I don't." I don't let my children play with devices or, or things like this. Um, but not as many as I expected. Um, I think we all have phones now. Phones, you know, ev even my husband, who took a long time to get a smartphone, has finally given in. Um, and so everybody has one. And once you see something done well, you think, oh, that was OK. That, that made sense. Um, that didn't stop me from playing the game on the table, but it, it supported me to play the game on the table. I would play another game like that. And so people become, once they have one good experience, they become more open to trying new ones. And I think um, the experience is getting better. You know, people are, are becoming more creative and, and have really found some good some good models to use as well for future games. So one that I really like is a game called The Search for Planet X, um, which I think does hybridity very well. And I saw they've just come out again in my office waiting for me to play, come out with a new game called The, Lost, the Search for Lost Species. So I think using that same model, but making a new game um, that works in a similar way. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was uh, really interesting to, to see all your projects uh, kind of con converging um, and uh, yeah, getting uh, some answers about it. Um, I have a very, uh, very experienced uh, question, uh, which is uh, uh, what kind of people um, are concerned about the project on uh, hybridity and the project on uh, distance play? So who was it? Uh, like socio-demographically, of course, but also there are disposi dispositions to technical devices or technology. I imagine you already explored that. So, um, uh, first question is that. The, the second is, um, with whom uh, were they playing? Like, uh, do you play hybrid hybrid board games uh, with the family uh, or with friends? And uh, in distance play, um, whether confined or chosen. Uh, do you play with family that is uh, very far away or people you talk closer? Great questions. <laughs> so our participants tend to be a little bit older. Um, we're looking at sort of an, an average age between about 35 and 40 on a lot of our surveys. It's very easy. When my students do evaluations, they get their friends. So yet again, we have lots of men between 18 and 25 doing those evaluations. But we worked very hard to include other groups. So we have, I think, in the big survey of 1,300 people, we still have 74% men. But we had more than 300 women respond to the survey. We had um, more than 30 non-binary people respond to the survey. So even though the percentages are, are kind of low, the, the numbers are, are going up 
so I was really pleased about that. Um, I did have a student do a study on wingspan and he managed to get 56% women participants, which was amazing and it said something about the demographic of that game. Um, they tend to be reasonably well educated um, and I think that sort of matches so far, fairly standard kind of board gamer, um, board gamer demographics as well. Um, what else? Uh, I'm just thinking what else we know about them. A lot of them talked about working with technology, um, but a lot of them say I work with technology so I, I like to get away from it when I play board games. So uh, working with technology doesn't necessarily make people more likely to play these games. Um, and I was surprised that we had, and this is challenging my assumptions, we had a lot of people talk about playing with older family members as well, particularly with distanced play. It was a way to keep in touch and um, keep them involved. But because most of the work, most of the feedback we had on distanced play was about during COVID, um, most of the people that completed our survey were living with their family. Um, so they were playing games face to face with their family but um, playing games online with their friends. And one of, one of the saddest comments, we, we have a paper that, that we're sort of trying to find exactly the right angle um, to publish it, but um, about what people told us about playing games during COVID. And one of the, I think, saddest quotes was somebody who said, I love my family and I love playing games with my family but I wish they liked the kind of games that I love. And so there was this interesting kind of um, loneliness that came in in some of those comments where people were saying, I can play normal games or, or you know, I can play some games with my family, but if I really, you know, it's my friends that I share this hobby with and they're the ones that I want to, want to play these games with, yeah. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. Husbands, do you have something about the audience of player the different board game versus not the different board game? No, not really. Um, we haven't we haven't done a comparison of who's buying hybrid board games and who's not. Um, again, I'm not quite sure how we would do that unless unless we put something inside the box of a game, right? And said, did you like, or tell us what you thought about this game, you know, fill in this, um, this survey. Um, because the audience of board gamers is, is so big, um, we're seeing kind of, sim I think, similar groups in terms of, you know, more men than women, slightly older, slightly, you know, generally well-educated. Um, one thing I would like to do, <coughs> pardon me, maybe with one of these PhD students is also to look at Kickstarter and what people are doing with hybrid games on Kickstarter and how they're marketing their hybrid games on Kickstarter um, because I think there's two things they need to sell, right? They need to convince people that their game is worth trying and they need to convince people that the, the hybrid elements are also worth trying or interesting. So there are children hybrid board games, 40 games hybrid? Yeah. Expert games. Exactly. Lots of different um, types of game and lots, as we said, lots of different types of fun as well. So uh, we need to think about how we would reflect that um, and what what sorts of surveys, what sorts of um, information we could get from people to understand that. Does Kickstarter really show all types of borders? I, I don't think so. I think Kickstarter, you know, that's that's one of the things that, that I want to explore. But but I think it's interesting because it's kind of trying to, to make that marketing push without necessarily having a game there already. Yeah. Do you have some data uh, about uh, solo games or solo plays? Uh, for um, that's a great question. 
We have some um, responses to the survey where people talk about playing games solo. Um, that was obviously something that a lot of people did again during COVID when they were locked down. Um, but less about, who was it you, Leia, that was talking about this earlier? About games that kind of use, no, it might have been Philippe, um, that use an app as an extra player so that you can play solo against an app. Um, we don't have numerical data, but we have, we have comments um, about that, um, but more data about people just saying, I played more solo games during COVID, you know, and I spent a lot of time working, working to get better at a particular game. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, I'm a uh, you talked about uh, your projects of um, uh, intergenerational uh, storytelling, and uh, I was wondering if you had uh, anything uh, in store uh, crossing hybrid board games and intergenerational storytelling. And what would uh, technology uh, add to uh, just making board games with, uh, with other people? That's a great question. So, and it's one I'm very excited about. <laughs> so, stop me when I talk for too long. Um, so, one of the really important things that digital storytelling lets us do is hear the story in grandma's voice or in, in grandfather's voice or connect to to media of the time. So really make that, um, that context of the events in their life much, much more relevant. Um, so what we want to do is, there's, there's some great research, right, on listening to stories from grandparents. People will do things like put a box in someone's home and when you're walking down the corridor, you can push a button and you can hear a story, grandma telling a story. But, yeah, my kids wouldn't have done that when they were walking down the corridor because they're walking down the corridor because they want to go to the toilet or they want to get food or they want to go to their bedroom or, you know, or they want to get a toy. They don't actually kind of want to stop and just listen to grandma for no reason. Uh, so the game kind of, if you like, it's, a, it's the pathway into the stories, but the stories might be, might be digital. So um, if you think about maybe playing a card or, or collecting a set of cards and that lets you scan a QR code or something and hear, I don't know, granddad talking about his garden or, um, or you know, your aunt talking about the end of the Second World War or something. You know, these, these stories become um, really important and really interesting, but instead of just being a photograph or a, a reference to it, you can actually kind of be taken into the story and hear them talking about it and, and preserve that memory as well. So we sort of see, we haven't started this project yet, right? But, but in, when we've talked about it, we see three ways that the game might be played. The game might be played by the family with the older adult and then maybe you use those digital tools a little bit less because the older person is there to talk about their experience. Um, <clears throat> they might play the game without the older adult, either because they're, they're just not there or because they've, they've died or they've, they're experiencing dementia or something and they're not able perhaps to tell those stories themselves, but you can still connect to those stories about them. And the third way might also be, um, Jenny, my colleague, is particularly interested in older adults who are living independently and who move to like a community for older adults. Um, we call them retirement villages in Australia. But, and, and it's like, hello, I've got my cards here. You know, shall we, shall we play? And it's a way to get to know one another as well and say, oh, you know, you were in... You were in Paris then, I was in Paris then too, you know, what were you doing? And to start some conversations. So we see different ways to kind of use those cards in different settings and with different groups of people, but, but particularly in that setting where the person is not there, um, that's where the, the digital tools really kind of come, come in.
but it's kind of meaning. I don't know. It feels more meaningful than pushing a button to hear a story. Like I'm not sorry. I'm I'm not. Um, I don't want to be disrespectful about that research because it's really interesting work. But I think that we can we can make it more personal to people and to um, the experience of telling and sharing those stories. And and maybe it becomes something intergenerational as well that maybe grandma's got a set but also maybe a grandchild has a set of cards as well and they can share their stories too. Thank you so much Melissa. Oh. I'm so sorry we have to stop here if you want if we want to have a nice lunch in a nice bistro. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again Melissa. I think we can oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.